What if the speed of light was 30 miles an hour? What if Earth had two suns? Which cereal mascot would win in a what fight? What if everyone lived underground? What if, it rained what if money grew on what trees? What if pigs could fly? I don't know if that would actually happen. It's much easier to store a unicycle than to store a horse. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. Are you guys feeling that winter chill in the air? Sort of. We record this ahead of time, so it's not... I guess it's technically winter. Oh, no, it's not winter. It's fall for us right now. I, I am, because I'm in my parents' attic right now, because I'm, I mean, I'm at their house, and that's where I can record. So, yes, I do feel the winter chill, actually. Yeah, Ben sounds slightly different this episode. He's on a, on a different microphone, so just give him that much. He's not just being weird. Yeah, grab me on a curve. Also, my parents have a cat, and I have allergies, so if I sound kind of weird, that's also part of the reason as well. I, I mentioned just because, just because we have a, right, right above our couch, we have like a window that opens up that we've been had pretty open for some nice fresh air, and now we're still in that habit of keeping it open, but boy, is it getting chilly coming in right on top of me. And uh... No, I'm pretty hot right now because our apartment building cranks the heat, and I have no control over it, and I'm on the top floor. All oh, right. Well, so we're all, we're all, we're all in different spaces. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 80 degrees for me right now. <laughs> oh, man. I don't, I don't miss living in an apartment, I'll tell you that. We'll be talking about the weather today, but not cold weather specifically. Our question today, though, is... What if it rained nonstop for a year? So just raining all the time. Well, I thought we changed it, didn't we? Oh, we didn't change it in this. But I thought it was, what if it never stops raining? Oh, cool. I wasn't sure. Aha! <laughs> Behind the scenes here, I wasn't sure if we committed to that completely, so left the question alone. I think we did. Does that actually, wait, hold on. Does that actually change anything for anyone? Wait, quick, side, side table. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we're good. I thought it might have changed stuff for Marcus, but I guess not. No, I'm good. I'm good. I didn't know exactly what you were doing. Okay. Actually, it does kind of change stuff for me a little bit. Yeah. I also would have done something different for mine if it was only a year. So let's let's call it eternity. Okay. So we're settled. We're doing what if it rained nonstop forever, all the time. Not just a year. What if it never stopped raining? A year is for wimps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're cooler. We also selected a an amount of rainfall. We're going with moderate rain, which is 0.2 inches per hour, according to Wikipedia, if any of you have already started your at-home calculations. But, Chris, before they have a chance to finish those and prove us wrong, why don't you get started with your answer? Yeah, so I started in what I thought was the most obvious place, which is flooding. So I want to see, like, what would happen with flooding and stuff. And I want to focus in on a specific city. So I focused on Boston, because that's where we are. And... According to the Boston Water and Sewage Commission, the Boston sewage system is designed for a storm of 5.15 inches of rain over a 24-hour storm, and that comes out to around 0.214 inches per hour. So based on our 0.2 inches per hour of rain right now, we would actually be fine. We wouldn't have any flooding, but I actually kind of dealt with the 0.2 inches per hour a little differently so instead of saying that it was like i don't know how you guys dealt with it but instead of saying that it's like uniform that's the rate distributed evenly throughout the entire world i said that that's like the base rainfall so like right now the average worldwide annual rainfall is 39 inches per year and if you multiply 0.2 inches per hour out to a year, then that equals 1,752 inches per year, which is 45 times the average of the world right now. And that's with, like, obviously we get bigger storms than just moderate rain, and that's because rain is, like, concentrated in certain areas, and you have a lot of space that doesn't have rain. So I'm basically saying that all that space that doesn't have rain has the base 0.2 inches per hour, and then all the stuff that does have rain is just added onto that. And then, like, it's all the normal weather patterns and stuff. So with those new numbers, we would get flooding. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I like I like I like I like the hmm. Based on this, Boston's fine. Let's fix this. <laughs> yeah, we definitely need flooding in this answer. <laughs> definitely not fine. <laughs> yeah. So we we'd have urban flooding, which is obviously an issue. You get a bunch of problems with that. But you'd also, in addition to urban flooding, there'd be an increase in the volume of water in rivers. So rivers would flood as well. And the majority of river erosion actually takes place 
during the flood stage. So rivers would erode a lot faster than they normally would. Um, I don't know the exact rate because I actually tried to find the rate of erosion and it was very difficult to find because I think it's like really dependent on the like the shape of the river and stuff. But yeah, you get a lot of a lot more erosion of river banks. So that's like moving sediment in the river down the river. You're moving like land. But that also happens on a larger scale where you're not just moving little small sediment and stuff. You're also moving big pieces of land and that results in landslides. So we'll have a lot of landslides and mud flows. And according to the U.S. Geological Survey, an average of 25 to 50 people die from landslides every year, which is actually relatively low compared to other causes of death. And that's with normal rain patterns. So uh, landslides, obviously, they're caused by lack of friction in the ground. So flowing rain and water downhill would cause more landslides. So like cities and towns near mountains would be in danger and you wouldn't want to live near a mountain. But that's a physical danger. In addition to physical dangers, there would also be biological dangers. So talking about like water moving land, it would move other things. You'd have runoff and runoff can, it can contaminate like reservoirs and drinking water, especially during flooding. So uh, our water supply would be a lot easier to be contaminated and it would put a a strain on our water treatment um, we'd have a, a water supply issue and you might be asking like why like if it's raining all the time why can't just everyone collect their own water you can just like stick a bucket out or something and everyone can collect it on their own you don't need like this wide water distribution system yeah chris why can't i put a bucket out my window <laughs> <laughs> you could theoretically rainwater is potable i guess but according to the cdc they say that privately collected rainwater isn't necessarily safe to drink. They say that dust, smoke, and particles in the air can actually contaminate the water before it hits the land, and it can be contaminated even from your bucket. I like how CDC has to hedge on that. Like, oh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it can be contaminated so that you can't yell at us if you get sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, even if there isn't any runoff, it can still contain chemicals and bacteria and parasites and viruses. Um, if it's not tr properly treated. And speaking of viruses, mosquitoes thrive in humid and rainy, rainy climates. So mosquito populations are pretty big in Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. And with mosquitoes, they bring mosquito-borne diseases like Zika virus, West Nile virus, dengue, and malaria. And about 700 million people contract uh, mosquito-borne illnesses each year, and about one million of those people die each year from mosquito illnesses. That's a lot bigger than our 25 to 50 people from landslides. So there are almost 3,600 different species of mosquitoes, which is a lot, and it's actually pretty difficult to track the number of mosquitoes in the world because they're just like all over the place. But according to MosquitoJoe.com, which I'm sure is reliable. <laughs> <laughs> Female mosquitoes lay about 100 to 200 eggs every three days, and they lay as many as three sets of eggs before they die. So they lay a lot of eggs. Mosquitoes are, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and this number of mosquitoes will increase if there is flooding and like humid climates increase and stuff. So directly from that, there'll be more deaths from these illnesses which is not ideal. So I've been naming all these problems, all these issues. I came up with four major problems. The flooding, so you don't want to be close to the land, like down low to the water. There's landslides, so you don't want to be near the mountains or anything. We have drinking water, which is an issue. And we have mosquitoes. Based on these four things, I wanted to try to come up with like, a, how, like where do we live or where can we live that's safe? My first thought was tree houses. That just popped into my mind right away. But it really only solves the flooding and the landslide problems. Like if you're in a forest that's like away from a mountain and you'll stay away from the water. But it doesn't solve the mosquito problem. It doesn't solve the drinking water problem. I looked into mosquitoes a little bit and I, f I found out they can't survive in temperatures under 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So I thought maybe we could go to colder climates. But foreshadowing a little bit to Ben's answer because I have a sort of an idea of what he's doing not exactly but 
he'll probably have reasons why that's not a good idea. <laughs> so we're not going to move to a colder climate. So I was thinking, like, instead of trying to stay away from the water, why not embrace the water? Instead, we can live under the ocean. So if we're under the ocean and it's done correctly, it's, like, completely sealed and stuff, then uh, we don't have to worry about flooding or anything. That's not an issue. We don't have to worry about landslides, obviously, because we're not near any mountains or anything. We're just in the middle of the ocean. Mosquitoes aren't going to be a problem. And for drinking water, I don't know exactly how the setup will be, but I don't know. We'll have like a giant funnel type thing in the middle of the ocean. And runoff will still technically be an issue because like there can be contaminants in our funnel. But one of the main concerns with runoff right now is that like it's going through and carrying like trash and waste from humans in our funnel we're not going to have any humans living on our funnel so we're not going to have trash in our funnel so i think that solves the drinking problem (laughs) (laughs) don't we aren't we able to desalinate to some degree as well if we're in the ocean we are humans we are science yeah i don't did you just say we are humans we are science (laughs) yes i did (laughs) we are humans we are science i feel like we looked into that a little bit before but like we found that it wasn't entirely efficient yet i mean we might get there at some point but i don't remember it was in a past episode i like the big funnel i I won't knock on the big funnel anymore yeah i like the big funnel too and we did actually do an episode where we designed an underwater city uh it was episode 67 each of us tackled a different part of it i think i did the water pressure and like what our shell would have to be uh marcus did heat i think I think heat and power, yeah. Heat and power. And then Ben did food supply. I don't remember exactly what the outcome of that episode was, but if you want to hear if it could be successful or not, go listen for yourself. Episode 67. Yeah, but that's what we would. I think we should do is live under the ocean. Marcus, what did you do? Yeah, so when I started researching what might happen if it just rained continuously for a while, I was surprised to find that not only had this actually happened before, But it happened not for just that year we originally had talked about, but for two freaking million years. So take a walk back with me, 234 million years, about a third of the way through the Triassic period. We're going all the way back. We've got supercontinent of Pangaea creating this landmass that cuts across the entire globe. The thing about putting all your land in one place is that it makes it very difficult for clouds and rain and all that stuff to actually get to the middle of it. So back at this 234 million years ago, the clouds tend to get caught on the shorelines and didn't form over land. So the middle of Pangaea, aka most of the land everywhere, was just one big giant desert. Then we hit the Carnian Pluvial Event, aka the Carnian Pluvial Phase, aka the Carnian Humid Episode, aka the Middle Carnian Wet Intermezzo, which is my favorite name for it. Why are there so many names? (laughs) Because... People keep trying to discover it differently, and they all have different ideas of exactly (laughs) what they're going to call it. But basically, just before this 234 million year mark, uh, we had a fairly modest amount of volcanic activity in what is now modern-day Alaska, known as the Rangelian eruptions. Also known as... (laughs) Also, aka the Middle Carnian (laughs) Wet eruptions. (laughs) Um... A series of volcanoes became incredibly active for a period of about, like, very, very active for a period of about 40,000 years and, like, continuously active for about a million years. And a lot of what is modern-day Alaska was created by this volcanic sediment. It's several miles thick. It's kind of tough to put into perspective, but over this period, over a million cubic kilometers of volcanic materials had erupted which is enough to cover the entirety of the United States in 500 feet of material. So this is how much stuff was spewing out in Alaska at this time. And a very brief time in a geological sense. And it messed with the climate quite a bit. Mostly because this released about 5,000 gigatons of carbon in the form of CO2 into the atmosphere, which is the equivalent of several hundred years worth of what we're releasing now in our, oh man, we're messing up the planet phase. It actually caused a global temperature rise of about 7 degrees Celsius, which, with that temperature rise, it's caused it to finally start to rain and rain and rain. 
There's not a whole lot of data on exactly how much it rained 230 million years ago, weirdly. Like, I was trying to check, like, you know, just like a daily average, but somehow there was no one tracking that back then. I'm always shocked about how they can learn any of this stuff at all that you just said. <laughs> it's actually pretty fascinating. I'll talk about it in a second, but first of the numbers quick. The estimates put the average rainfall per year at about 55 inches, which is about the level of a temperate rainforest. And this was actually everywhere in what was previously basically a desert. So it basically went from desert to rainforest over this period. And what's kind of crazy to me, and what you're, I was kind of alluding to a second ago, is that we didn't even really know that this happened until quite recently. It was like theorized in the 1970s and 80s that this was going on, but actually the first like couple papers that were like, hey, maybe there's all this rain around here, got fairly quickly dismissed by the larger scientific community. And it wasn't until 2012 where we actually had enough good data to support the theory. And kind of what happened was they started off with, hey, we know we have all this dry red sandstone and all these like rock formations that are from a very dry air climate. But then like, hey, we suddenly find a bunch of river rocks and big rocks that indicate there was like a lot of water around all of a sudden. And it's like very abrupt. And it kind of got shuffled away as like, oh, there's probably some like literal like hurricanes or like individual weather events that might cause that. But they kept finding the same kinds of deposits all over the world. Like China had like these bigger rivers kind of in the same thing. And they're able to cross reference all these geological ages. And because we get better at dating things they coalesced into, instead of being kind of sporadic over like this 100 million year average, it was like in the specific 2 million year span, which is again, in geological terms, very quick. <laughs> so now it's commonly accepted that this Carnian pluvial event occurred. And given that no one really knew it existed and, you know, I had never heard of it before, it was kind of an important time in history of, of evolution. First off, during this time, a third of all marine life went extinct. Now, this is partially due to all the volcanic activity. Like, it does it, it does add some, like, acid rain and stuff into the picture. But on the land, like, also mass extinctions. Because all these creatures that had been adapted to this arid climate suddenly were not in a dry, arid climate anymore. And kind of what tripped up a lot of these scientists going through, and what makes this unique as far as these mass extinctions go is that as much as it killed off a whole segment of life, it's pretty special in that it also jump-started pretty much just as much life as it kicked down. Like, you have events like a meteor impact, it makes the whole planet toxic for a while, and basically your species diversity goes way down, and it takes time for it to, you know, rebuild and recover, and the, you know, the planet to kind of acclimate back to a steady state. This really, it just became a warmer, wetter, climate that was actually conducive to life, just different types. So kind of the, the underlying cause for a lot of what was happening is, is thanks to all this rain, larger plants were able to be supported. So in these dry, arid regions that were before, it's like you'd have, you know, bushes. Uh, I don't know if cacti were there back then, but like, you know, like low to the ground shrubs, not a lot of vegetation. Now suddenly trees are sprouting up, large vegetation, huge, like huge ferns. It's actually the birth of the conifer forest. So the first time you have these like, um, shoot, I, th I think conifers are pine trees and crap like that. I believe so. But actually the first versions of these forests were happening in this period. Also, this period, this, this little window here is where you're seeing the first like evidence of any mammals to exist. The modern versions of plankton, algae, and corals made their appearances here. Like this is like the building blocks of our modern ecosystem. And most importantly, and of course I saved it for the last, it was the start of the reign of dinosaurs. The thing that all these archaeologists, you know, all these uh, archaeologists are looking at. Prior to this Carnian pluvial event, about 5% of fossils that are found are of dinosaurs. After this episode, the number of fossils that are dinosaurs is closer to 90%. So basically they went from barely any dinosaurs to almost every fossil we have from this era is of a dinosaur. Like this like shaped the whole freaking world like wildly. Like it, it kickstarted everything that we know today. So that's, that's just wild to me. So yeah, really cool stuff going on. But of course here, our hypothetical, we're not stopping 
at a measly 55 inches of rain. Of course, like you said, if we consider a moderate rainfall of 0.2 inches per hour, we have 1,752 inches of rain per year rather than 55. This much rain is well beyond the wettest rainforest. Not as much as you think, though. Top end real life rainforest, they get about 400 to 500 inches per year in like the wettest, in the wettest ones. That's like the extreme top end. So yeah, our scenario, even with our more extreme conditions, I think on the long term, I think we still end up with rainforests. Maybe a bit more extreme. I was initially kind of a bit worried about trees surviving when they're more or less always submerged in water. But there are trees that already do that. Like mangrove trees are cool. These are the ones that you imagine, like if you're imagining a swamp or like a, you know, a tree like just off the shoreline that have the roots go down and form like this intricate kind of web. Um, those are all different types of mangrove trees. And they're pretty cool because not only can they grow in water, they can grow even in salt water. They actually have the ability to filter salt out from the water that they're in and like absorb just the fresh water from the salt water and then like store the salt in, they like store like in their leaves and their bark on like their extremities that will like eventually fall off and, you know, get rid of it. So they're really cool. They're really able to get rid of like contaminants and all that type of thing. I should use them for my drinking water under the ocean. Yeah, I just need mangrove trees. So, assuming the trees can evolve to handle this water, they'll have plenty of it, which means the next real competition point for, you know, evolution will be getting sunlight. We've talked about this once or twice before on the show, but there's an issue where, like, you know, I was worried about photosynthesis, for example, if there's no sun, because it's always raining. Plants can still capture sunlight that penetrates through the clouds. So even on cloudy days, plants are able to absorb the sunlight that's able to make it through the clouds. Like, if you can see, there's light getting through the clouds. And actually, there's, like, a efficiency point somewhere where, like, a partly cloudy or slightly overcast day is actually the best time for photosynthesis because then the plants don't dry out. But long story short, trees can still survive even if it's always, you always have the cloud cover, even if it's always raining. If you want to hear that long story, we I think we had a whole episode or a whole answer on it in episode 104. What if it was always overcast? That's the one, right? Yeah, what if it was always overcast? Yeah. So, good stuff there. And so, I'd expect to see this same race to the sky, which creates these huge rainforest canopies. Like, the reason rainforests have such big plants is that there's all these resources to grow, and it makes kind of the last competition for the sunlight. So, whatever it can be the biggest and fastest to get up there and build up that canopy is going to be that. So, we're going to have basically big forests. It's going to be rainforests everywhere. And then I didn't get too much in details of like what's, what goes on kind of at the forest floor. It's going to be probably a bit swampy, like, you know, swamp critters and tree climbers and marsh swampy animals are going are gonna to thrive and evolve towards that. So probably less dinosaurs and more alligators, I guess. <laughs> uh, and yeah, unfortunately, probably a lot of some mosquitoes too, which is just no fun. I kind of ruined the whole idea. I really had a cool image in my head, but yeah, it's just going to be full of fracking mosquitoes. Yep. It's going to suck. <laughs> but because hey, they, they, they suck your blood. And with that wonderful joke, Ben, what did, you, what did you cover? I looked at, there's one sort of, you know, we're, we're saying that it's raining constantly, but that can't actually be true, just that statement on its face, everywhere in the world, all the time, because... When the atmospheric temperature anywhere gets below freezing, that rain is going to instead be snow. And I wanted to figure out what happens when that 0.2 inches of rain suddenly is becoming snow for likely, in most places, an extended period of time. And first off, there are very few places where you won't get snow at some point in this constantly raining world. I'd expect that there would be a band where you wouldn't ever get snow, but even very close to the equator like at the equator, you're still going to at least approach freezing occasionally. So the lowest recorded temperature ever in uh, Quito, Ecuador, which is the capital of Ecuador and is like just off the equator, was 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you know when that was? Uh, I don't offhand. Forget I asked it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> sure enough, it was a January. I remember that. Okay. But I do not remember like the year. Uh, unfortunately. But basically anywhere, you're going to at some point have to deal with snow. So when this happens, how much snow are we looking at here? Because I've always heard like the rule of thumb is that an inch of rain is roughly a foot of snow. But I had no idea if that was actually true or just something people said. 
And according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, it's actually one inch of rain is roughly 13 inches of snow. Uh, and that, that'll vary uh, depending on the moisture content of the snow. So if it's like sleet, it's more like two inches for every inch of rain. There are apparently conditions, very particular conditions, where an inch of rain will make about 50 inches of very dry, powdery snow. What? They sadly did not give those conditions, and I desperately want to know what they were, because that seems insane to me. Is it just, like, because it's making, like, a crystal pattern that's, like, really not dense? Yeah, well, so it would have to be, it's super weird, because it would have to be the lowest moisture content possible, right? It's got to be mostly air. It's got to be just, like, a like a cotton candy almost. Yeah, and I think the other thing, too, is that you'd have to have... Because, you no know, snow will accumulate larger flakes when it, like, blows around up high in the atmosphere before it actually falls. You basically have to have a situation where there's just enough moisture to actually form snow and very little, like, wind activity in the, atm- like, higher atmosphere. So it can just drop immediately without collecting a bunch of extra mass on it. I feel like bigger flakes would be better for more volume. You'd have more void space in it, right? I think. I don't know. I could be wrong. It would really depend on how th- like thick the structure is, because if you have like a thick band that's like very dense, even though the, the thing as a whole is bigger, it would depend on the math. Right, yeah. And it's really tough, because every snowflake is unique, so you can't even math it. Exactly. I really tried to figure it out, because I just wanted to know, because that was absolutely insane to me, but they sadly did not elaborate on that. I was really sad. But... I figured, you know, I was just going to use that average, you know, we're talking about using moderate rain. We're going to use the average snow equivalence. So that 0.2 inches of rain per hour winds up being 2.6 inches of snow per hour, which on its face doesn't sound like that much, but that's a foot of snow every four hours and 36 minutes. And for a little bit of context, the all time like seasonal snowfall record in Boston was, you guys probably remember the 2014, 2015 winter. Uh, where we had like oh my god four blizzards including i think <laughs> two within like a week of each other i actually wasn't living in boston at that time but i came up for a like a corporate event and i remember besides it just being buck wild snow everywhere i had to switch train cars because yeah. the doors were frozen shut on the train like half of them were frozen shut because of the snow and so like they literally came out with the announcement and be like hey if your door doesn't open move to another car some of the <laughs> doors are frozen shut i just remember walking like wandering on the highway because there are no cars at all <laughs> yeah i was living at the time in brighton which is you know a very like student housing area and there were snow walls in brighton that were easily 7 feet tall because there was just nowhere else to put any of any of the snow you know, no one has, like, yards to pile it in, really. So it was just all in these huge walls on the sidewalk that felt incredibly dangerous at all times. <laughs> but in order to hit that amount that, you know, over the entire winter season there, that would take about four and a half days. So we're going to have a lot of snow falling. It's actually, every square mile, it's roughly six million cubic feet of snow per hour. And freshly fallen snow is depending on the density, six and a quarter to 12 and a half pounds per cubic foot. So that's something like 28,000 tons of snow per square mile per hour, um, which is slightly more than the way of the Statue of Liberty, which is 27.1 thousand tons. So lots of snow. And, and really what I immediately thought of was just, is there literally any way that within, you know, the first few hours, every single roof in every single city has not collapsed? And the answer is probably not. <laughs> a like good condition roof can generally hold around 20 pounds per square foot of extra weight. That'll vary depending on what your roof is made out of. If you have a apparently like an aluminum roof because it is a uh, you know a lighter material, it can support more just because of the way houses are built. But sort of generally around 20 pounds per square foot, and that only winds up being around two or three feet of snow which is going to fall in, you know, half a day. So I looked into if there was any way that people have to automatically clear snow off your roof. I was hoping that, like, not that just a normal person would have, but some crazy rich guy would have so he doesn't have to go out with a rake and, you know, 
clear off his roof in a snowstorm. Yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do when I get too much snow on my roof. I go out with a rake. Oh, okay, <laughs> a snow rake is a thing. It's not just an actual rake. A rake was the probably the wrong <laughs> word to use. I mean, what you're talking about right now was an issue that year that we we're talking about. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So I was hoping there was some system that people have made to deal with that. And there's not really. So the answer, as far as I can tell, is just to have a like steeply sloped roof that doesn't have any flat spots or anything. What you can run into and what they do have. So when snow freezes, it'll freeze in like ice dam sometimes where you'll just get like this little wall of ice that'll basically stop run off from running off your roof. And that's when you can run into trouble in a normal snowstorm because it'll just build up behind that and eventually collapse your roof. And people do just wire their roof and then heat those up to melt gaps in ice dams. So there's always a place for it to flow through, but no one like heats up their entire roof to melt all the snow on it constantly. That's very extra and no one's ever done it. And it's probably a really bad idea for home safety to make your entire roof get hot. People do do it with driveways. And I try to figure out if there was any way you could use the same system for a roof but I eventually decided that just having a sloped roof is probably going to be easier. So short answer on that, our houses probably all look really dumb once we've, you know, rebuilt after this starts. And they all have like party hat spire roofs. Like really, really pointy. Yeah, just because yeah. you can't have anywhere for the snow to stay. So now that we've resolved being able to have homes, I guess, on a larger scale, what are we going to even do with all this snow? Because as long as the temperature is below 32, you're going to continue getting snow at this 2.6 inches per hour. And someone's going to have to handle it. So the way that we handle it now, if you are a, a city or an airport or someone who has you know a large area you're trying to keep clear, uh, you melt it. There are melting, uh, like snow melting machines that are generally, uh, you'll set up in a parking lot or some area like that, haul snow to them. And then they'll have usually a tank of warmed water that snow is dumped into to melt it. The one I looked at specifically was the, uh, I'm going to probably not pronounce this right, Trekin, Tre- Trekin Combustion? Sure. Uh, 350PD Snow Melter, Trekin Combustion. They're a Canadian company. As far as I can tell, most of their business is snow melters. Their website has two categories, snow melters and other products. <laughs> <laughs> What's in the other products? The the other products were all like boilers and stuff. It was like very much what they do is make things hot and their best application (laughs) apparently is melting snow because they're in Canada. It's basically a 52 foot long, 10 foot wide truck that has a large tank of hot water and four huge burners that keep it warm. The water is kept about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So not like boiling hot because it doesn't have to be. It just has to be, you know, above freezing that you dump snow into. It's called the 350PD because it can handle around 350 tons of snow per hour. It uses around 405 gallons of diesel per hour, which is roughly $1,500 of fuel per hour at market price. And the problem you may have picked up on is that that 350 tons of snow per hour is a lot less than the 28,000 tons of snow we're getting per square mile. And it works out that we actually need 80 of these per square mile just to break even on snow in any area where people are trying to live, which would be around $120,000 of diesel per hour to keep all those running, along with whatever you need to actually, you know, get the trucks to haul the snow there. <laughs> just put it on there. Just put an order on their website. Yes, I'd like 437,000 of these, please. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> so the short answer, I guess, is if you want to live somewhere, you're probably going to have to have for basically yourself, one of these insanely expensive snow melting machines. Or I don't really know what your other option is, honestly. <laughs> How else you could live? All that diesel, global warming, less snow months. <laughs> yeah, I was going to try to figure out some way to like figure out exactly how fast we'd completely destroy the climate and no longer have temperatures below freezing ever. But that got depressing pretty quickly. Yeah, because you you have to compare it to what we're doing, and you find out that, like... Oh, it's only an increase of 10%. Yeah, it's not too far off. (laughs) Yeah, it's like... (laughs) Oh, we're we're doing this already, huh? But yeah, so I think the answer is basically, 
you don't live anywhere north of like Texas or the equivalent elsewhere on the world. And even then you're going to have months where you're just like running from creeping snowstorms as the temperatures drop. Unless you happen to have one of these insane machines that you can run for, you know, millions of dollars a day. Or if you live under the ocean. Or if you live under the ocean. Oh, the funnel, though. The funnel's going to get clogged with snow. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> A flaw. Why didn't we think of this? <laughs> oh, no. The only flaw in the system. Uh, my system's fine, though. My system of letting the world evolve is just fine. <laughs> my, 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 my solution of letting mass extinctions occur and then evolution take its toll is still working out swimmingly, guys. So <laughs> Pretty reliable pretty reliable system there i mean if anything goes wrong with chris's system his will also work out swimmingly hey hey, hey. well now that ben has ruined chris's answer <laughs> we can <laughs> move on to our would you rather question marcus are you ready for or would you rather yeah would you rather have it rain honey or oil i guess like vegetable oil <laughs> or something well we should determine what type of oil because that would actually change my answer for now, I'm going to say vegetable oil. I might change it, though. See, my, my gut was like crude oil, which is very different. Yeah, I was like, imagine gasoline, like, <laughs> yeah, like tar raining from the sky, in which case it was pretty obvious. But no, I think it's better as a, as a vegetable oil or honey. I mean, I'd rather be out in oil than honey. I'll say that right off the bat. If I'm going to get caught in it, I'd rather be raining oil. That said, I think oil is gonna mess with our infrastructure way worse than honey's gonna <laughs> probably honey gets to dissolve oil's job is not to dissolve <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point i feel like honey yeah honey will like it's harder to wash away but like is it always honey or is it like one rain of oil or honey that's a really good question a very important question i guess we can just say one rainstorm of equal volumes and we're, we're saying like a you know it's like a summer thunderstorm or is this like a like how much are we talking here it's, it's, it's like a good storm like a good rainstorm yeah like more than a moderate rainstorm it's like like a couple hours of pretty good rain yeah yeah oh man this is this is really brutal because it's it's one of those where i think a lot more things break with the oil but also the honey is just so bad for me personally so here's the other problem with honey is that it's gonna like, oil, if you don't clean up immediately, is going to just hang out as oil. Honey's going to crystallize. Does vegetable oil, like, attract animals and stuff? Well, if it does, it's going to attract them everywhere equally. Right, but that'll be... I was going to say that, like, honey definitely attracts animals. Bugs, bugs, bugs are going to have a field day with the, with the honey. Yeah. You're going to have a bug problem. I mean, the oil is probably more dangerous in terms of just, like, stepping outside and doing anything. Oh, because it's the trip hazard? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was thinking even a little smaller scale where I don't like de-icing my car. I don't want to have to de-honey my car <laughs> to go somewhere. But I feel like you could just, like, hose down your car and you'd be fine. All right, so here's a thing I've learned. I was trying to figure out if animals are attracted to vegetable oil. Apparently, maybe... <laughs> good, good job ben good so all right so answer. <laughs> the answers i've seen a lot of them are related to used cooking oil which is obviously different because then they're attracted to like the fact that you fried chicken in or whatever but one thing i did just learn is that apparently sometimes at least for dogs cooking oil can induce diarrhea or vomiting so that's maybe a point against the vegetable oil <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I I was gonna mention when we're talking when when you were uh, speaking of diarrhea, when Chris when you're talking about your funnel and contaminants when we were doing um we were hiking this last weekend we ran out of water, and like we're hiking right by like this beautiful mountain stream and I'm like oh it's so clear and good I think you can drink these like I think it's f like generally fine if it's like a running stream, and then I googled it and it was like yeah most of them are fine but if you get one that's not fine you can end up with months of bloody diarrhea. So I didn't drink that water. <laughs> Good call. Um, ugh, honey is so sticky and bad. Honey is so sticky and bad. I'm trying to figure out which one's harder to get rid of. Oil. Yeah, probably the oil. I mean, soap gets rid of oil. But yeah, but you need to use the soap. Like, honey just dissolves in water, right? Well, think about it this way. Like, you're going to have, like, the oil's going to go down and... 
it's going to go down the creek and end up on the pond, and now the pond's going to have a film of oil all over it. Oh, yeah. We have the same issue with the honey. Honey's like the worst short-term thing. Like, honey is way worse the day of. Oil, I think, just will be a huge problem. It'll stick around, yeah, and be a problem long-term. Either one of them is going to wind up in your groundwater. And I feel like I'd rather have honey in my groundwater than vegetable <laughs> oil. Well, it can end up in your groundwater, but it specifically won't dissolve in it. <laughs> okay, you got me there. <laughs> Touche, sir. I'm going to say this. If I was put in charge of keeping society going, if I was mayor of a town, I would rather it rain honey. If it's just me and everything breaking is somebody else's issue and I just got to deal with what happens like on my property, I'm going to have to go with the oil. So oil is better for Marcus personally, but worse for society as a whole. Okay, so which do you choose, yourself or society? <laughs> if you're going to make me pick one, I'm going to pick myself. So okay. boom. Oh, so you're choosing... I'm choosing Marcus oil. choosing oil. So I, it, this only just dawned on me, but oil is slick. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I feel like walking places, but specifically driving places, is going to be hella fun, like Tony Hawk Pro Skater. <laughs> well, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is doing any kind of large-scale cleanup is going to require vehicles. And all those vehicles are going to be, like, driving through buildings because they can't stop. It's going to be very dangerous. I think specifically during the storm, too, a lot more people are going to die in the oil storm than the honey storm. Yeah. I think I'm going to go with honey just because oh, I hate it, but I just feel like it's the oil is going to be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also going to go honey. I think it's easier to get rid of. It's more of a short term problem, but I also think that it's like the oil is more dangerous until you actually deal with it. All right. There you have it, folks. That was a good one. I like that. I, I like want to talk about that one more. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. <laughs> But sadly, we're at the end of the episode, so instead of more riveting honey oil rain conversations, uh, instead you get to listen to me pitch our stuff. Basically pitch the thing you're listening to. So if you like the thing you're listening to and you want more discussions like this amazing discussion we just had, one way to help support the show is to leave us a review. Hop on your podcast app, whatever you're on, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, some new thing that I haven't heard of because I'm an old man. Spotify? Does Spotify do reviews? I don't know. I don't use Spotify. Are we on Spotify? We are. <laughs> well, then heck yeah. Put it on right <laughs> in Spotify. I love Spotify. Go hit the review button. It's somewhere there. You can navigate there. You're clever. It's a really good way to help with the, the algorithms. And when people find the show, they're more likely to actually listen to it if there's some good reviews there waiting for them. So super great way to help the show. And it's free, unlike this next option, which is going to www.patreon.com slash absurdhypotheticals and becoming a patron. You can donate a dollar a month and you get access to all our extra content that we produce specifically for our hypotheticals on the, the Patreon. We come out with cool stuff. We're doing, um, we call them fireside chats right now where we have kind of chill hangout. We, we kind of talk about the previous month's episodes, but mostly we're there to hang out and just chill. It's, it's it's a very cool and chill vibe, and we go on many, many, many tangents. Marcus tried to be an audiobook reader last time. Oh my god, yes, and I can only do British accents, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> god, I forgot I did that. Man, thank god that's behind a paywall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're also in increasingly desperate straits for more questions. We can't make the show without hypothetical questions. And clearly, we're running low on would you rather questions, even though this one was awesome. We'll take either of those. Send them to us, absurdhypotheticals at gmail.com. We'd love to get your questions, and then you can be immortalized forever in content creation. Also, if you're on YouTube, you can just leave them in the comments if that's easier, because you can just scroll down. You don't have to look for an email or anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. We're on so many platforms. It's wild. Spotify, YouTube, is I know. You know what else is amazing, Chris? Uh. What's going to be amazing is that we're going to be back next week with our holiday episode for Christmas and our Christmas question to spread the holiday cheer is what if everything was christmas that's a lot of christmas mm -hmm.